Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our coffee chat, EDC coffee chat this morning. We are excited to have Ned on. I'm not going to say your last name because I think I'll get it wrong and you can uh, say it for us. Um, so Ned is the, uh, the director of career tech education for three school districts. Those three school districts are Squim School District, Crescent School District, and Quileute Valley, which is located in the Forks area. So uh, Ned works at the school district level rather than at the high school level. Um, and he is promoting and organizing and preparing career tech education classes, also known as VoTech. So it's really important that uh, in order for our workforce to be a strong one, ensure that our next generation of kids that are graduating have the skill sets in hand that will make them successful in our local workforce. And um, so I know it's something that a lot of people on this call are passionate about and they've talked about when when we certainly meet with our business owners, their biggest issue today is a lack of skilled workforce and not even people applying today. So connecting those kids that are graduating with opportunities um, are, is really important and making sure there's truly career connected learning is essential and connecting that not just high school to directly into the job world, but also high school and then Peninsula College and onward. So um, with that, just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you're not on mute, I'm gonna go ahead and put you on mute or ask you to put yourself on mute so we don't inadvertently pick up some background noise. And if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or put those questions in the chat and I'll go ahead and call on you. So with that, Ned, say your last name and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ned Flater. That's just like later with an F. I know it's not spelled that way, but uh, I didn't choose the name. Uh, it was given to me at birth and I've kept it ever since. And I've been called floater, floater, everything you can imagine, and a few things I can't repeat. So it's good to see everybody here today. Matt, it's good to see you. I appreciate all your support. Mr. Stauffer, Dr. Stauffer. Thank you very much, Jim, for um, being here today. Um, you know, I just I want to start off. I have some slides prepared just to kind of breeze through this to be more informative. Uh, and then I'll open up for questions. I don't want to take a lot of your time, but there have been uh, some pretty radical changes in the career tech education world over the last couple of years. And primarily those changes are a recognition that um, school districts have not done a very good job of preparing students for trades or industry level, entry level uh, kind of um, professions where they can go in as journeyman apprentices uh, and um, move out from there. And that's because the culture of school districts for several years has been pushing towards a four year college um, plan. And it's just been recently over the last um, three or four years where the laws have changed and regulations have changed to support career tech ed in a much different direction. And one of the most significant changes I think is opening up graduation pathway for students who complete a series of career tech education courses, which gives students motivation to attend those courses in high school. With the advent of high stakes testing over the last 15 years and in, in, uh, you know, as a re requisite for a graduation, some kids have real hard times passing those uh, high stakes tests and struggle meet, meeting their graduation requirements. And that's in all districts, not just specific to a, a district. And so the fact that CTE has opened up graduation pathways makes it you know, very advantageous for kids to go into the CTE um, if they don't pass their high stakes test, but the CTE programs facilitate either industry ready credentials or dual credit agreements with local colleges, the kids can, can graduate. And that's a, a, a big boost for our kids. And we're seeing that industry is really driving uh, in many ways, the motive to 
open up more and more CTE capabilities in um, school districts. So let me show you some slides here and I wanna give you some information and then I wanna open up a little vision that we have for creating better capacity. All of you who are in industry understand the need for um, meeting industry requirements by creating capability to do so. Well, if the school district's in industry and CTE is becoming a focal point, then we have to create more capacity to meet the requirements of industry. And that means creating capabilities in education for teachers, training, infrastructure for you know, the need to house and to, and, and to have classrooms that are actually are effective in meeting the very needs that are, you know, that replicate industry type uh, settings. And so with that, I'm going to share my screen with you here in just a minute and pop up a um, Uh, um, kind of an informative um, slide presentation. Um, when I stepped into this job six months ago, I had the opportunity to meet with several people in our community, Colleen and Lori Fazio and Matt Hewish, and just, uh, they took me around on a tour of all the manufacturing. And, and uh, I also got to meet with all of our teachers uh, from three different districts and started talking about what are some of the things that are holding us back. And each district has unique issues that you know we work through to solve. But I wanna start here at SWIM. And one of the things I'd like to see us do here at SWIM is um, really create this idea that career tech education can be a center of excellence for our, uh, for our students and our staff to work in. And that's important because by its very nature, career, uh, CTE gets a little bit more funding than general ed classes. And so, it's advantageous to the school district to have more kids enrolled in CTE because more funding comes because of that program. And it's advantageous to have teachers who are certified in teaching CTE classes because they get a little extra stipend for their efforts. Uh, and it's more advantageous for kids to be involved in CTE because they open up different graduation pathways for them and different opportunities for them post high school. So there's a lot of advantage, but we have to have a capacity that can meet the emergent requirements of our industry and of our school district. So let me uh, go from here. I want to talk about five, five basic points. What are course offerings? Talk a little bit about dual credit agreements that we have with the local colleges. Our enrollment in CTE, the staff that we currently have here at SWIM, and then the way ahead. These are the current course offerings that uh, we have at SQUIM for our CTE programs. On the left, you'll see the title of the, the, the programs and, on the, and in the middle here in this, this area here, you'll see little numbers called SIP codes. And these codes really um, tie into OSPI, the Office of School of Public Instruction. Um, they tie into those and they are like a funding code for us when we, offer these courses. Students who are enrolled in this get extra funding into the district so that we can afford the resourcing for these programs. And you see that we offer two currently at the middle school, Introduction to Computer Science and Robotics Foundations. We're actually increasing those course offerings in the middle school uh, this coming year to add biomedical detectives and um, science and technology. And those would be career uh, tech ed courses. Uh, we're getting our teachers prepared for that and we're getting the frameworks approved at the state to do that. Every one of these courses has about nine chapters that you have to work through the state with to get approved and funded. It's not an easy task, but the state does work hard to help us uh, uh, achieve those goals. And um, go ahead, question. Christian. Oh, sorry about that. Well, I think that was an inadvertent. Steve's? Go okay. right ahead. Our enrollment currently at SWIM is uh, in the high school. We have approximately what's called a full time equivalent is 206.1 students full time. That means a student, it's a five period uh, requirement to, each, to reach one FTE. We actually have about 653 students enrolled in various CTE courses, 
But when you do the math and you crunch it down for funding, it equals 206 uh, full-time equivalent. And that's what we're paid for and funded. Now in the fall, we started with 214, but because you have attrition throughout the year, um, we lost about eight students. And then the middle school, even though we have approximately 45 kids involved in those two classes, it, it equates to a 12.75 funding line for our FTE. One of the things that we have to do is we have to stay clear on what is the labor market data to support any one of our programs. Each year we have to revisit what is the demand of industry. And so every year, twice a year, uh, we meet with our general advisory councils and our individual programs have advisory councils too. And they go over the labor market info to help shape their um, standards for the class. So Ed, Ned, um, yes. quickly, there was a question from Rebecca about yeah. your classes and uh, Rebecca, you wanna ask that? Or if not, I can on your behalf. Feel free. Feel free. I was just, it was such an exciting listing of classes and I was just curious what the kids are most interested in. I wanna go back to high school with all, all those cool things there. Well, if you talk to any eighth grade, any eighth grade boy, he wants to be a video game design guy. All right. And I mean, that's, that's their nirvana. If they could just play video games their whole life. Um, but what we've tried to do is create this mindset of industry, 21st century industry technology, industry skill set, which computer programming, com coding, uh, game design, um, computer aided design, uh, engineering, these are all part of that 21st century skill pattern. In that programming, we actually brought in and, and, our, and in that eighth grade class, for instance, we're adding uh, simulators. Uh, we have a driving simulator to help kids learn their driver's ed before they get into high school. It's a, it's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> to, we're adding uh, marine simulators for marine, avi uh, marine navigation. Uh, we're going to add uh, aviation and drone simulators as well. So that is exciting. And, um, but, you know, the kids' interests vary based on the exposures we give them. For instance, with the, you know, over the last several years, you, you can't find a middle school that teaches a traditional shop class. They just don't. They teach more towards the STEM because STEM had received so much um, you know, uh, enhanced support from the state. Well, what we're trying to do is modulize uh, not only the STEM issues, but some of the more hands-on issues because it, we're starting too late if we get into high school and we introduce shop then because we have kids all rolling into high school in ninth and 10th grade that don't know the difference between a flathead screwdriver and a Phillips head screwdriver. They don't know the difference between a claw hammer and a ball peen hammer because they've never had that exposure because a lot of education has moved towards um, these kinds of things. So one of our goals here at SWIM, and in fact, any of the districts I've supported is to, is to create a culture in the middle school that exposes kids to the various CTE programs they will be able to choose when they get to high school, whether that be a module of wood shop, a module of um, STEM related uh, material technology, a module of hospitality, like culinary design, career choices, these kinds of things have to be started in the middle school. And uh, that is something that we're doing uh, pretty successfully this year. So what they're interested in really depends upon what they know about. And so the more we expose kids to things at younger ages with respect to CTE, the better choices they make when they get to high school. One of the things that we're trying to do too, though, is we, every year we do what's called a comprehensive local needs assessment. The state mandates it for our Perkins Five funding. But what that illuminates is, is the demographics of kids that aren't interested in the various aspects of CTE. For instance, if we were to just take SQUIM's CLNA and compare it, what's some of the demographic gaps that we have? Well, one of them is a gender gap. We don't have a lot of young ladies who are interested in welding. We don't have a lot of young ladies that are interested in automotives. So we have to do something about that. And what, what do we do? Well, 
does welding always mean iron on iron, flat iron? And, and yeah, in some cases it does, but we're gonna be creating a metal art um, program for kids that gives them exposure to that. And that metal art now does more artisan kind of work, craft work, and it exposes them to some of the things that are in the shop world. So we can do a better job uh, uh, being more flexible with the kinds of things we offer so that more kids have interest. Hope that answers your question. These are currently the teachers that we have here at um, SQUIM that are um, working in the CTE program. Most of them have four or five periods of CTE throughout the day. But one of the things we've recognized here in SQUIM in particular, and during our general advisory meeting, I had taken every one of the people who came on a tour of all of our classrooms. And it doesn't take long for us to um, recognize that you can't convert a classroom into a culinary restaurant, or you can't convert a classroom into a health clinic. It's just almost impossible. Um, so what we're trying to do is create better capabilities. Uh, and one of the visions I would have for our district here uh, is to build a structure that replicates manufacturing and industry kind of settings, as opposed to taking a classroom and trying to convert it into something it was never intended to do. What I'd like to see us do is by the end of the school year 23, 24, and this can be pushed out depending upon the support we receive, and this is not a promise. This is just, this is my, if this is my dream, my, you know, kind of, and I don't think this is my dream. I think collectively we see this as a need within our community. But I'd like to see us push out and build a steel building that has an open bay uh, factory man, uh, manufacturing kind of um, environment assigned to it. Three open bays that are each 40 foot by 100 feet industrial grade access to water, power, and air. Currently in SQUIM, if we have the auto shop working with the impact uh, tools and the wood shop working with impact tools, our um, air compressor shuts down. It doesn't have the power to run both classrooms. I mean, that's just because as we've added, as we've added things to the program, it's required more of our structures that they just were never designed to do. But we like to keep it an industrial grade where things are, you know, when you walk into a manufacturing plant, things are up high where you can reach and pull them down uh, and you can get them and you can move them throughout without having to cobble things together to make it work. I'd like to put in that building two fully resourced classrooms that are 30 by 100 feet that are fully kitted out. Spaces include restrooms and showers and a fully resourced industry rated restaurants grade kitchen by 50 and 100. Why is this? Well, if you go into a culinary arts classroom, you can see that it was a classroom converted to be um, you know, a home ec room, but we're no longer teaching home ec. We're teaching hospitality, tourism, restaurant you know, style cooking. So we have to have capability that replicates what industry has for us. The primary purpose, and you can see some of the pictures I've cobbled together here. The primary purpose for this would be that when a student comes in to this, into this facility, they get that feel for what it must feel like to work in a manufacturing factory, you know, a housed construction facility that has the requisite capabilities to frame, um, you know, small um, structures, has a capability to fabricate, has a capability to you know, adjust to whatever need we might need uh, to meet for the student. And as we add on capability in terms of, you know, programs, uh, we want this to be able to adapt to it as opposed to uh, cobbling things together. We want to, and this again would be a supplement to the existing classrooms we have. Um, we want students to have access to industry rated tools and equipment that are not currently compatible with the classroom structures that we have right now. And we want to replicate manufacturing, construction, factory workspaces. It could they, have a uh, secondary purpose. Ned? Yes. We do have, um, let's see, a comment. It looks like Kenneth Riando. Do you want to share your experience and 
where that comes from regarding a pneumatic and or battery electric tools? Yes, thank you, Councilor Riano Port Angeles. I, I came out of industry. I graduated in 1970 and went right to work at uh, then Crown's email, now McKinley. But I also trained before that at Peninsula College in auto mechanics. And I can tell you uh, over time that from what I'm seeing that battery electric is, is it's just gonna take over. They're so much easier to use. They're very powerful and dependable. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Kenneth. And we have recognized that too, that uh, there are a lot of um, better tools that are battery powered today that have more more power than sir, our air. So how how can we make sure that when you get to the point of design, that that we are really strongly connected with local businesses to ensure that we are putting in the equipment and the curriculum that meets the most um, up-to-date, state-of-the-art kind of opportunities within a budget? Sure, I think that's a great and fair question. And I think that's gonna require uh, cross-communication with industry as we do the design piece. As we talked earlier, <clears throat> Colleen, um, this idea, this vision, if you will, is something that I am uh, trying to put together for when our new superintendent rolls in and I can brief her on this and get her um, support and then move forward. Once I have that, then we will take and put together a small working group um, that will uh, begin to address those very issues of what's our, what are our priorities with a structure like this and how do we um, take those priorities and put them into action. And so I think that, you know, as a general um, vision, um, this is, you know, great, but once we uh, actually get the approval from our superintendent and board to move forward in the plan up phase for this, that's when we bring together industry as a part of a working group. Uh, we begin to prioritize out uh, not only what this building does, but how we do it within the building and what types of resourcing it needs. And we put together a timeline for, you know, start all the way through to uh, close out of the building. And I think the reason I want to do it that way is because, you know, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And I want to make sure this is something more than just a personality driven, um, you know, approach to this. Some of the frustrations that you've talked about earlier about how you've been talking about this for years, it's because the rotate, you know, the, the throughput of people in a position, you know, rotates pretty quickly. And um, so I want to make sure that whatever we do has legs to it beyond my own personality and my own capability. And that's going to require an ongoing working group that meets to make sure that this isn't doing what it needs to do. And then, in fact, that's the intent of the, the policy written at the state level for CTE programs, is that we have a better partnership with industry. It's not us doing something for you or you doing something for us. It's us working together to get something done for the students. And uh, that, to me, is going to be critical. And that's why I've been very grateful for the times that we've been able to spend together, because that is moving us in the right direction having so, those conversations. Yeah, I, so if I can share here for just a moment, um, my when I ran the Washington Business Alliance in Seattle for three years, the biggest success that I felt that we had was getting the state to include funding for expansion of career tech education programs in the high schools because initially that was all just going in, the McCleary funding was all intended just to support uh, increases in teacher salaries. Correct. And we got $314 million uh, biannually as an increase going forward as part of that McCleary funding. So I've, I've had a lot of experience in this space and what I've found too, and I've heard from school districts um, and businesses that have been involved with local school districts is a real problem has been that the advisory committees that are mandated for career tech programs are really not 
um, that useful, that it's just a check the block kind of um, meeting that happens quarterly and it's not truly the career tech education teachers listening to and working hard to understand who are the entities within their local community that can guide them into a direction for their classes that will be the most uh, successful for those businesses to have the right type of education um, being taught so that they can hire those kids when they get out. So that is um, something that I think is like really needed that it's not a check the block advisory committee meeting that it is taking their input and making changes where and recognizing you know you've got tons of budget constraints but um you know well, as things are being crafted right listen listen to local industry i agree 100 percent. and i think this last six months you know you and i and a, a group we've met over five times in this last six months Kay and I have communicated a number of times. Uh, we are bringing people in to this conversation in a way that's meaningful and intentional. And it is not just a check the block thing because just like we as a school district can say we have budget constraints, so does industry. Yeah. You know, and we, you know, we have to work within those budgets and constraints creatively to meet the emergent needs that are happening. You and it's also a false um premise to say that all money is going to fix stuff. Uh, we have to have a vision that we can put money against that makes sense, not only in the now, but five and 10 years out. One of the things that I've been trying to do with our teachers is get them in a, in a, in a spend plan mindset and a life cycle mindset, just like industry does. There is you know, a serviceability to our equipment that we have to plan for five years out, 10 years out. And we have to think about how we're gonna replace that equipment and what we're gonna replace it with. Uh, we typically um, hear um, you know, our brush fire mentality. So let's push this brush fire out right now because it's hot, but we don't think out in it up. And so that's something that's changing because our industry partners are starting to come up and give us those kinds of um, you know, cultural uh, differences. Kay, you have your hand up. Yes, I wanted to put in a plug for the um, community advisory panels, and I'm sure there's a history of unhealthy ones, but um, Squim Sunshine Rotary definitely is supporting the school district and trying to get the voice of industry um, connected. And that's one vehicle that is very powerful. And I've already seen improvements in that, um, the community advisory panels, but it really takes industry to come out and share their voice and their needs uh, with with the CTE program. So I just wanted to plug that as one one way to in, improve. And I will tell you this, that SQUIM under the, you know, uh, leadership of our current and our previous superintendent has elevated the CTE program to a directorate level, uh, which is, you know, huge uh, because I work directly for the superintendent and have that ear and what I do not want to do is get ahead of my incoming superintendent in a way that um, you know doesn't allow her priorities to be met as she hits the ground. So I want to make sure that that is discussed here is that this is in preparation for when our new superintendent comes. I'll have that opportunity I'm sure to brief her on the programs that we uh, facilitate here and where we have spent the last six months working towards to move it forward. And your inputs are going to be important. I want to finish this out real quick. Sure. This building can also have a multi-purpose capability. I see it as potentially because it is a large space. We can house various events. In the case of a um, Cascadia event where we have an emergency that happens near our community, we could also quickly turn it over to a base of operations for emergency support, emergency crisis center. Let me see if I can make this. The floor plan would look something like this from the ceiling down. You can see there's three open bays, two classrooms, restrooms, showers. The reason we put those there is if we did have a, a crisis where we needed to uh, put restroom, you know, had multi people there, uh, we could you know, at least give them showers and, and 
you know, place to clean up. And then a kitchen on the one end. You can see that these are big bay open doors. This will allow us to palletize uh, projects that the teachers are doing in their classrooms and move resources in and out of these bays, which also gives us the opportunity to teach uh, forklift training to our kids. Kind of a look at the, the way the, the um, building would look from the inside. You can see a classroom module sitting here in the center, a, a kitchen on the one end, again, very industry type restaurant looking grade. And then over here on the outside, uh, the open bays. And again, the outside, I wouldn't want it to look like, you know, um, Farmer John's uh, building. I would want to make sure that, you know, we have a, a, a good look. The skin of this would look good and uh, be, uh, you know, an addition to our community, not an eyesore. The proposed site that I would pick for this is uh, the old soccer field that, uh, parallel to Hendrickson Road. You can see the new greenhouse is already there. Plenty of, of of ground there to put not only this building, but another building in there. But the reason I selected this is not only because it's an available site, but if you take a look down here at the end of this, the south end of this area here, you'll see that um, a lot of, this is our automotive and shop and our FFA uh, area over in here. So we've got a lot of CT already co-located. Again, estimated cost, I want to move on through that because as I, when I talk with the Port Authorities, they're like, that ain't, that's not even close. Uh, but I would say that, you know, as we look at this and we begin to plan this out, we could get our cost estimates in. So what would be the way ahead for this? Well, I want to, you know, I've been running this by a lot of folks within our community and in my district. Um, I want a proof of concept authorization. I want to stab and that comes when our superintendent rolls in. I want to brief her the same brief we've been briefing you. I want her to be able to say, move forward and draw fire. And that's exactly what I'll do. Establish community support working group, which we're doing. We've got lots of folks interest, but I want this to be more formalized where we meet on a regular basis. We work and refine the proof of concept. We do what's workable and achievable. Um, we research varied cost estimates. We establish the timeline. We determine how we're going to get this funded, um, whether it's levy, bond, private donors, grants. We produce a final concept. We receive our board approval to move forward and do this and establish community support all the way through, fund the project, and get going, break ground. Questions for me? Great. Thanks, Ned. Um, I think, let's see, there are several questions and some good ideas in here. Um, Brian Pruitt has a question about CDL training, Brian? Well, I can- There we uh, go. You got it. Oh, there we go. You got it, Colleen, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm really encouraged to see this concept move forward. Uh, you know, when you look at the statistics from the state, when we have 20% of our seniors lost every year to graduation, I think there's a real opportunity for getting meaningful education. They'll get them in the workforce and put some of the losses there. But Ned, I, uh, I'm look, you know, I used to be in Votech back in Skagit County. And one of the things that I saw there was they need a lot more workbench space for working on projects, tearing starters apart, you know, rebuilding right. things like that. And uh, the, the big, the big doors, uh, I mean, I'm a farmer guy. I love those big doors, but, and I love the, the concept. But I, I wonder if we couldn't get more leverage here by doing something like a CDL driver's course and driver's training, because when Walmart's advertising 92,000 a year to start a mm -hmm. driver, and we know that at 18, you can be an over-the-road trucker within state. You can't go out of state until you're 21. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for doing something with that, too. So uh, I'm looking for things like plumbers, electricians, and carpenters. Those are the big shortages we have right here, right now. So it's encouraging that you're moving forward. I'd like to hear some about uh, what do you think about a truckers program? Yeah, again, I, I one of the reasons we like to put a forklift in is so we can get some of that you know equipment uh, certifications done. Again, one of the things that limits school districts with respect to certifications is age. And we have to, you know, 
um, be careful that, like for instance, one of the things we're doing in our biomed program is introducing EMS and EMS response. We are actually uh, contracting with some of the EMS teachers to bring in and teach EMT training, but we can't get them certified EMT until they turn 18. It would be the same thing with CDL. We can, you know, through um, simulators and through some of the smaller equipment, we can get them um, ready to take those CDL uh, programs, uh, those CDL uh, tests, but we can't actually certify them until they're 18. Now, granted, we do have several seniors who are 18 years of age. And so our goal is to get them prepared and we actually support in their certifications. We fund a lot of their certifications here at the school. So like for our um, first aid, CPR, basic life support certifications, we pay all those so the students don't pay a dime. And we would do the same thing for CDL or heavy equipment. But we have to be careful because state law governs a lot of what we can do based on age. And then also our risk management pool, you know, we have to always communicate with them about the things that we're doing so that we don't incur a liability from insurance that we can't cover. And that's always going to be an issue when we, one of the things we're going to be starting up is uh, we're working hard to get some apprenticeships and internships going uh, for our students in the industry. And the, uh, the issue with that always is, is the supervision of those students, the liability of the industry that brings them in and the liability to the school district if we have an injury. And those are not insurmountable problems. They just take smart people thinking through them practically to get them done. And so that is a goal that we're gonna bring right along as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Ned. Um, another good, oh, so that CDL question, uh, I know Mia Boster from Peninsula College is on. Mia, can you, Talk about whether or not, you know, what um, what Peninsula College has in regard to CDL or maybe Camilla, Rico? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk, but Camilla's in here as well. And I just chatted with her to get her to jump in, and I think she will. Um, we offer it through our non-credit program. And Camilla, I think I'll I'll let you pick it up because you've been offering several. Um, classes that have been filling, so. Yeah, so we have um, CDL tra training through Peninsula College. It's a four week program. Um, and we have been working with a couple of um, high schools to get high school students directly from um, high school and into um, the program. Um, and we have classes in Forks and in Port Angeles. And we've been offering about um, three classes in fall and three classes in spring, um, none in winter, so yeah. All right, well, terrific, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we also have um, some questions from Patty, Morris, Patty. So Patty was talking asking about the skill center in Port Angeles and how there was considerable funding, grant money, and um, actually curb loan that the county is still paying on uh, to create the skill center at 8th and C. And that was a lot of kinesthetic career tech kind of classes. And it, of course, closed. Now, the biggest problem there was that um, you, the expectation was that all five school districts would have the um, kids bus to the school, to the skill center. And the skill center was a separate entity from the high schools. And so the funding went along with the, the kids. And so that meant that there were two problems. One, I think, and I think some Cindy Kelly and some other people could speak to this that were very directly involved, but kids would leave the high school, the money would go with them and they would take say three classes in a day and they'd have to be on a bus for a long time. And so it didn't 
work out for the other four high schools very well. And it didn't work out uh, for the kids having to be on these buses. And so, and it was uh, cost a lot of money uh, to the Port Angeles School District that they were losing, I can't remember, $400,000 annually to keep the skills center running. So this would be a subcomponent of the Squim School District. And um, so it wouldn't be pulling money away. And I see Jim Stoffer, one of the school board directors has his hand up uh, that he wants to address that. Go ahead, uh, Jim or Ann Cindy. Yes, Colleen, uh, that's pretty much the synopsis of the skill center um, transportation, um, which is a factor. Um, the students on the buses, because uh, again, it, uh, the main purpose of the skill center was for the five school districts here in Clom County, so that includes Nia Bay. So picture riding a school bus from uh, Nia Bay into Port Angeles to attend those classes and uh, Coyote Valley and in, and even from, from Squim. Um, that cost was uh, pretty hard to maintain. Um, and uh, with the offerings that were available at the skill center. And um, along with that, um, state legislators uh, made uh, 24 core mandatory credits that, uh, so we're missing, uh, a, a, just a typical SQUIM student uh, would uh, say, go over there for a class, a two hour class, and then would be out of, uh, squim for a half a day and could not uh, then complete the other uh, requirements of that 24 core and so it just was not economically um, sustainable for the school districts and um, that's uh, more we've done it more locally now there's things that are going over uh, what's called the west sound cooperative and it's out of bremerton and central kids have and some students from Quilcene, Chemicum, and Port Townsend are uh, heading to uh, Central Kitsap. And Central Kitsap has an aeronautical CTE ro um, robotics um, courses going on there. And uh, I don't know how, um, I'd say Quilcene, which has a lot, lot lower um, budget than uh, than uh, Port Townsend and us and Port Angeles out there, but uh, they are getting some students down there. But that's that's what happened to the Skill Center. It was a great concept back in the day, so that was the '80s, early '90s. But um, um, you need the funding on site, the buildings on site, the gear on site. And that means bonds and levies yep. from the community. So, Colleen, so. I'll just address a little bit. As a 20-year school board member, um, we did create uh, programs in Squim and in Forks and in Jimicum, and they could have went there, but um, there was a little politics that went on there too. And yes, districts were losing some of their FTE, but you have to remember that Port Angeles was the host district and we were taking the hit for that. So yeah. um, I, you know, I struggled with that for years because I couldn't understand why administrators didn't understand about CTE. And I think we still have that issue regarding administrators not understanding what CTE is. Um, and that we need to look at students going to school and not trying to um, just graduate students. And I appreciate Ned doing all this work. And Ned, I wish you were around 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I, I see uh, Matt Hewish also has his hand up. Matt? He's the city manager of Squim. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Colleen and uh, Ned. Nice to see you again. Love your presentation. Sorry, I got a, I had to take a call. I um, called right when you started. So, uh, you're the man with the plan, and I, I love it. Um, number one is I hope your supervisor is as supportive as um, it seems like the community is and and sees the need. I was going to ask you more about because uh, Colleen and I met last week uh, about some other economic development uh, opportunities and what are the right targets so that we don't aim at the wrong thing. But so we're really trying to drill down in, into the data. 
do you have good data? And maybe you've shown this before and I've missed it. I, I've, I feel like I know your program really well, but the data that supports it, uh, like how many, what is our deficits in the, in these various industries, plumbing, electrical, carpentry, like how, what, how much should we have for our population versus how much we don't have? And then also what the average wage of those folks are once they're licensed and you know kind of it it seems like if we built this uh and i'm sure you, i mean you're super bright guy so the more we can data support this the more obvious it becomes and and uh it certainly seems like especially after talking to colleen it's the it's kind of what the peninsula needs it, it fits the you know it fits the need so anyway super supportive of you but uh, i'd love to get it at my hands on as much data as you can uh leading up to you know your presentation to your new supervisor so thank you sure and i appreciate that matt and we do you know it's funny because as you drill down in the data you know it's hard to push that out into a meeting because it immediately puts people in, in a coma uh, you know, but uh, unless the data applies to your specific area, right? But there is, in a nutshell, when you look at the data across the region, you can say it's too much of not enough. Right now, I could we could get eight paramedics hired in Port Angeles Swim if we had, and they would pay the paramedic training. I mean, they would they would hire EMS right out our gate if we could get them. You know, and so part of that issue is is bringing industry back into the classroom, which COVID for the last two years has kept out of the classroom. But, you know, one of the things we're doing, like in our biomed program, is we're bringing in EMTs into that classroom for a week. Uh, and they're going to not only train the kids, but they're going to talk about their experiences. We need to do the same for every industry that's in need, uh, that we build those relationships, not just as a one-off either, by the way, but starting in eighth and seventh grade, where they have those exposures, they begin to build those relationships in ninth and 10th and 11th and 12th grade. I'm an old military guy. Right. And, and uh, one of the things that the military does really well, and there's a lot of things they don't do well at all. Trust me, I, I've seen that falling. But they do a lot of good with their recruiting process of building relationships through over a continuum. If you take and you talk to a military recruiter, he doesn't want to come in just for the senior class. He wants to come in in the ninth grade class and begin talking to those kids, building relationships, and figure out which kids are a good fit for their for their need. Well, uh, and like, I think that's the same thing with industry, is that we have to do that as a part of what we're doing every day, you know every year in class, and the data will support that. And I and I think what uh, will interest the kids and get the support of hopefully leaders is is that data like any graduate program they usually tout uh they usually tout about their placement you know how many people get a job out of their program and what the average salary is coming out of their program so i think those are the kinds of things and 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 how what the deficit is like you know which is of course the placement ratio or directly tied to that so anyway i I, I applaud you, you know everything you're doing. It, it, it certainly seems like uh, the peninsula is in need of something like this. So thank you very much. Matt, I appreciate the time you spent with us and we're gonna to continue to build on that because we're gonna need your support going forward with anything that we do. So yeah, thank you, uh, Matt, really good question. And I did put in the chat a document that comes from CareerBridge Washington, and that is the official list from the state of what is in decline and what career codes, specialty operation codes are in demand. The problem with that is, and I've seen lots of problems with it working with OMC, I gave this as an example, they used to show that nursing was in decline in Clallam County. And I contacted them and they do have the guy's name um, right there that manages that list. The problem is what they do to determine what's in decline and what's in demand in an area. And by the way, they don't they don't look at Port Angeles. They don't look at Forks. They look at they lump together Jefferson County and Clallam County. And so in order to get funding from, say, a Career Connect Washington program or something, you've got to show that that skill set is in demand. And that's something that I think is really, really important is, well, from my perspective, I'm about economic development for our county. So, you know, you look at those programs that are in Bremerton for aerospace, 
we don't have any aerospace jobs here or companies here. We have zero, zero. Uh, we have mechanical, you know, ACTI and that kind of thing, but not aerospace. So if we're training for aerospace, we're, we are training for our kids to leave our community. And that's just not something that in my mission scope, I would ever support. So um, we've got to show that there's a, a demand locally. And so what I started to say is the way ESD determines this in decline and in demand list is they uh, hire a third party and that third party goes in and counts how many openings there are on say indeed.com and the other aggregated um, uh, job uh, boards. And then they know when people are retiring in general age because they have all this beautiful data about our entire workforce. And, but the problem was OMC was advertising three job openings. They were not advertising 90 of you know registered nurses. So um, they showed it was in decline. So I had to contact them. And I, at the time I got Eric Lewis to speak to um, them to say, nope, you're way off. And so we have to keep an eye on that list. And I put that list in the chat for our area. And if it's way off, then we need to be contacting them and giving them information about why their information's wrong. And so, you know, construction in construction industry, they don't post their their openings on indeed.com and the monster.coms and even work source necessarily. They but that's a reason why they should, but often it's word of mouth or on Craigslist or, you know, Hartnagles puts it on their own website. So that's the challenge there. So gosh, we, we've got lots of questions. Colleen, I want to address this one from Mr. Wilson. Steve Wilson said, is there student interest in these programs we have a video game creator for TikTok? Absolutely. But here's the, here's the rub. That interest is completely dependent on the activity that goes on in the classroom. And I, and, and I think that that is, a classic example is in our automotives. This year, we, we we purchased some equipment in the automotive department that brought us up to industry standards in tire balancing, wheel alignment, um, cert, you know, all those kinds of things that are that are right now happening in industry. We're bringing back into that classroom, and kids become interested in that. Right, uh, the more kinds of real world. Um, Right now, we have to turn away kids from our biomed program because the, the curriculum that we purchased for that from Project Lead the Way, it is so impressive. And the, what we're doing in those classrooms is so impressive. Kids want to be involved in that. And I would tell you this, that the more we push down into the, the middle school, the exposure to these other programs we have in the high school, the greater interest we are already seeing. So yes, there are lots of interest in these programs well beyond video game creator, TikTok influencer, but it's directly dependent on the kind of class that's being run. Uh, and uh, those classes that are primarily hands-on, they're the ones that are getting kids in them because that's the, the, the type of mentality of a kid that wants to go in the trades. They wanna get their hands dirty. Our floral um, class, we have two classes, uh, floral design, overflowing with kids, uh, all demographics. I mean, because it's hands-on, it's doing something that um, meets an artistic um, um, need for that student and showing them that this is a business they could run themselves. So we have three people with their hands up, Kay, Roy, and then Mia. Um, so Kay, go ahead. We'll try to get everybody's uh, comments, questions in before we cut it off at just after nine. I'll make it quick and I and I appreciate all the chat uh, input and from a Rotarian perspective, uh, Matt, you gave a good plug for a July 1st opportunity to get the community involved, to learn more about this, see a lot of questions. So July 1st, 4 p.m. we'll be at this uh, high school cafeteria. We want everybody to come out and learn more about this. We're going to kick it off with the facts and data. Colleen and EDC is going to talk about the facts and data of what jobs are needed, what education is needed. Ned's going to give this presentation. And then um, we will hear from business leaders. That these are how many jobs I want to fill. These are the skills that I need to fill these jobs. And this is how much I pay. 
And then there'll be an opportunity to get a guided tour of the facilities that we have now and meet and greet with uh, Senator um, Lisa Wellman. So it's a good opportunity to find out how your business can benefit and influence the education uh, in our community. So that's my pitch for July 1, 4 p.m. at the high school. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Kay. Uh, Roy. Unmuted. Uh, hey, excellent. I'm, I'm eager to catch up with that uh, previous speaker's uh, parade. That sounds like a great thing. Ned, I sent in my email for you to contact me and I think I can be helpful. I developed with people the Clark County Vocational Skills Center and designed and produced Running Start and managed a $5 million pre-employment, re-employment training grant for Western Washington University and Bellingham Tech in Whatcom County when they laid off 6,000 workers at Intalco in Georgia Pacific. Currently working with a attempt to pull together something which is a, a trailer way behind you guys, which is a natural resource a job collaborative out here at Forks with Huxley College and Peninsula mm -hmm. College and local people, but we've not been able to get good demographic data. So I'll work with Ned and others on getting better data. And we, as very experienced in this work, uh, know that it isn't the kids who can't read and want to work with their hands. It's not just that. It's, it's a lot more complex than that. And also the delivery systems that cause the the Clark County or Clown County Vocational Skills Center to fail was the logistics most certainly, but we designed one in Clark County and Callitz that served almost as protracted of an area and took that FTE hit at the home schools and took the transportation. But here our skinny demographic doesn't really fill up those boxes, whether it's robotics or whatever. So how to conceive an on the job training field where people would go to Les Schwab or other tire stores as part of their school day, just like people used to go to food service or work in the mall as DOE and EODDD and VOC program would really provide just in time delivery for the numbers of specifically interested skills by skilled providers. And how to build that mechanism is a lot cheaper than building a building with a tire alignment tool that's gonna to require 50 tire aligners in the next five years here on the peninsula. You know. How to, how to build those models. So I'll be eager to work with you through Ned and, and others. And I sure appreciate the remarks of uh, Cindy and, and many of the other people. But it's been, a, I just have been back on the peninsula for a few years from working for Western Office of Field Studies. And we studied demographic data and emergence of new trends. And we're gonna finish some of this projects out here at Forks primarily. So that's, I'll be a good partner because we're not just squim PA. I'll, I'll stop talking. Great, thanks Roy. And as you probably heard, um, Ned is the director for career tech education for Quileute Valley Schools in Crescent. So uh, Mia, please. Thanks, Colleen. I just wanted to follow up on the, um, the in-demand list that Colleen shared. We all um, have to work through that every year. We wait for the new one to come out and then we look and we see that they've dropped medical assisting and welding. So I wanted to give a plug for the Peninsula College and the high school CTE advisory committees because they are the employer's voice that does matter. And uh, when we see those fall, we reach out to our advisory committees, our welding, our medical assistant uh, specifically have uh, sent us some emails that we forward to the state and they will move those careers into either balanced or high demand. And so I'm going to put my email in the chat. So if anybody, any employers in this room are interested in serving on one of the Peninsula College advisory committees, uh, please email me. Uh, we're always looking for new people to join those because your voice is really important and it does it does guide what we teach, the equipment we have, the funding, and allows us to build our strong high demand programs. Thank you, Mia. And I put also in the chat, uh, Robert Huglin's email. He is the person that manages that in decline, in demand list that we put in the chat. So if you are a business owner and you look on that list that I put there and, um, and if it's, zero so if it there's a oh gosh there's a uh, a let's see the long-term growth rate uh is what you want to look at and if you're pretty far down on the list or a negative you that would say that you're a in decline career so food preparation workers is in decline 
according to them. Welders, cutters, solderers, and blazers, it, brazers is in decline, which I know that's wrong. I know that uh, you've got um, uh, Del Her, which is a huge company. They can't find any welders. I've heard the same thing from uh, Herman Brothers. I, you know, and Lincoln Industrials just got bought out. And so there's gonna be a company that comes in and fills that gap. And so, yeah, I, and also I know that uh, Perry Knudsen at um, Bricks Marine is looking to hire and has welders. So it's an example of where their data is just straight out wrong. So um, anyway, I think we are pretty much, yep, 9.03, I'm going. So thank you everyone for joining us. Really appreciate the robust discussion today. And I'm looking forward to July 1st when we have an in-person event.